whether the cost of electricity is time specific. Because the solar electricity comes in when it's very hot, which is when you need the, the, the cooling. Uh, and if there's a time of day variation that is significant, uh, then it becomes much more effective uh, than otherwise. And there's also the question of linking it to the grid so that surplus electricity can actually be sold to the grid. So lots of changes that have to be made to facilitate SPV, which have to be made by a large number of different regulatory bodies. I won't go on because I'm running out of time, uh, and uh, let me mention three other areas and illustrate the same point. We haven't, by the way, quantified what the impact of all these things would be on total electricity. That requires much more detailed work. But from what I've seen, uh, the impact will be significant. It will not lead, as some people would hope, to an actual reduction in emissions, but it will lead to a much slower growth in emissions for any given growth rate, which is also, for a country at our level, is the critical thing. Now, on transport, I mean, clearly, uh, I don't want to, this is probably the most obvious, uh, basically, land use planning, which minimizes transport, rather than land use planning, which takes transport as a residual outcome, is a very important thing. That has to be done by the city urban planners and all the rest of it. Easier to do uh, if you're doing it for a new city, much more difficult when you're doing it for an existing city. Uh, and, and to some extent, the whole assumption that, you know, if you do, if you do mixed land use, then you, do, you don't have concentrated areas where people work, workspaces can shift all over the place. For this to be effective, Logically, it should be possible for people to move where they're, where they're working. And for people to move where they're working, the rental laws have to be such that encourage renting. If the rental laws are such that nobody wants, dares to rent out their house, then this whole assumption that people will move closer to their workplaces just doesn't work. And that's one of the biggest problems in India, because you know, in India, the urban land and rental laws are so rigid that people hang on to their house and want to move wherever their jobs are. So they, they'll be getting different jobs, but they're not going to be moving residents. Big problem. The other thing, of course, is the shift from public to private, private to public transport. All rather well known, it hugely saves on uh, the use of fossil fuel. Uh, but it can only happen if the system is such that either the public transport is self-sustaining or you're able to subsidize it. Because if you're not providing a good quality public transport, the chance of people moving from vehicles to their own vehicles to public transport, very low. And I think interestingly we found that, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the constraint is the last mile. I mean, it's all very well having a very nice bus which go, or metro that goes from A to B, seven kilometers. But if to get to the metro that last one kilometer uh, you have to either walk or take a rickshaw or something. And at the other end, you have to either walk or take a rickshaw. Well, either these methods of uh, transportation should be available, and more importantly, they should be secure. And women, uh, women who have to work are not going to be willing to move uh, from a metro station to their home, which is one kilometer away, if they're coming home after dark. They'd much rather get into the car in their home and go to the office. So. Those are, those are dimensions of a mutually supporting set of policy interventions, which again involve cooperation between whoever does land use, whoever does transport planning, the police, and a whole lot of things. And I think one of the big problems is that uh, we don't actually have mechanisms where these things are being coordinated. At the moment, in many cities, even the metro is run by somebody quite different from the bus service. And simply getting coordination between the metro and the bus service is a big enough problem. Um, I want to spend some time, a few more minutes, uh, Ravi, on water. Remember, you began late. So uh, water. Now, this is different from energy. But it is, to my mind, a huge problem. Because we are now uh, very aware that in planning for growth in India, water is a natural scarce resource. And I don't think we have in place, virtually in any city, a rational way of managing water. Now, what is a rational way of managing water? 
The first and the most important thing <clears throat> is that the water cycle must be viewed holistically. I mean, you're extracting water from a natural source, purifying it a bit, giving it to people. It goes out via the drains as one or other, as sullage or sewerage. It's very important that we have a comprehensive view of the water cycle, that what we return to natural water bodies is water that is sufficiently pure to assume that we're not polluting the natural system. So you take water out at a certain level, must return it at, if not exactly the same level, at a level sufficiently pure that after running for a little while in the river, it'll become clean again. We are definitely not doing that. As a matter of fact, most people's definition of the water problem is how to extract water and give it to people cheap. Now, first thing is we should cost the whole water cycle, not just the cost of taking it out, purifying it, and piping it. If you cost the whole water cycle, you have to make up your mind. I mean, who's going to pay for it? Remember, urban India is much richer than rural India. So if there's no logic in my view, none, for not pricing the water in a manner where, given some lifeline use, which you can always define, and once again, this is cross-subsidization, given a lifeline use, the rest of the water must be charged in order to recover total cost. Now, you could argue against that in the sense you could argue that sewerage can be paid for by property tax. But you know, the honest truth is, first of all, most of our municipalities have lost control over property tax. Many state governments fix property tax and fix them very cheap because they think it's a good way of winning elections. So quite honestly, I think that particular uh, route is compromised. Many people, many NGOs are very keen to move to a system where water is rationally used. Almost none of them recognize that the core to that is pricing of water. And I'm not talking now about the poor, because you can always say so many liters, the meter will be there, but the first so many liters will be either very cheap or you could even make it free if you were so inclined, providing you do the cross-subsidization on the rest. And I think this is very, very critical, because otherwise you will get exactly what has been happening you build a whole lot of sewage treatment plants which are not able, many of them don't get enough sewage because a lot of the slums are not linked to sewage, but that can be sorted out the way Delhi is supposed to be doing. But they don't run as in UP because essentially they can't cover their operational costs and therefore they don't pay their electricity bills, therefore the plant stops. Now the present situation in the matter of sewage is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, we have in the country sewage capacity, sewage treatment capacity that covers only 30% of the sewage generated and 70% of that capacity is in Mumbai and Delhi. So quite frankly, this is, this is a crisis of monumental proportions. And I, I mean, uh, when we get a political system or a political person or a political party that redefines water in terms of water and sewage, it will be the next biggest step that we've made because it's very clear that it needs to be done. And actually, one, one needs some innovative solution. One very good innovative solution that one NGO put out at a meeting that I addressed here in the Habitat Center some time ago was that the only way Delhi, which, by the way, Delhi discharges 70% of its sewage untreated. Uh, although half the sewage capacity is unutilized, and that's because the slums are not linked to the sewage plants. So one of these NGOs suggested that the best way of doing that is to have a regulation that said that all sewage will be dumped into the river upstream. And this is the only thing that will really encourage people to do something about it. I'm not sure it's from an engineering and otherwise point of view optimal, but it's interesting that there is no judicial activism or public activism on this aspect uh, of the treatment of water. And actually what has happened, the other side of water treatment obviously is harvesting of rainwater. Typically what is happening now is that cities are getting water from distant, more and more distant sources. And while we know that there are huge 
interstate problems in sharing of water, it is increasingly becoming evident that there are intrastate problems. Farmers are not at all happy that water is taken out of something which could go into irrigation and sent off to some city in the same state but 150 miles away. And mind you, the farmers themselves are determining their demand for irrigation on the assumption that the cost of water is zero. Uh, we all know that you know, uh, we could economize, uh, we could double water efficiency in agriculture. I have Ashok Gulati, I guess from his smiles that he's endorsing what I'm saying. But you know, if you're not gonna price water to the farmers, why on earth should they actually do anything to economize? And there again, the solution is made regulatory. Uh, unsupported by pricing. So, this is a major area where, frankly, in India, unless we can say that we're going to do something, uh, we're not going to succeed. And here again, the interconnections between different levels of policy and who has to intervene are really very large. I don't have time to talk about solid waste management, but I just want to say that, you know, uh, India generates, I forget, 70 million tons or something of that kind of solid waste, which if all of it was used to produce energy, would produce 4,000 megawatts of electricity. The actual electricity produced from, from solid waste management is 200 megawatts. So that gives you a sense of the gap. But here again, we have a major issue. <clears throat> Many private entrepreneurs love throwing out slogans like from waste to wealth making it seem as if this is actually a net profit generator. It isn't. What is true is that it costs, a, if you want to treat solid waste scientifically, it costs a lot of money, particularly landfills and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you are going to incur that anyway, <clears throat> and you build into that treatment of solid waste in order to produce electricity or fertilizer, that will generate a net surplus that will reduce the cost. But there is no alternative. I mean, municipalities have to recognize that it costs money to handle s solid waste, but the total cost could be reduced if we can build in uh, these sorts of systems. Again, multiple people have to intervene. And one of the most obvious is that, you know, how much you value uh, the electricity produced is a function of what electricity costs. And actually, most cities ought to value it at the marginal cost of electricity, not the average cost, because the average cost is grossly uh, distorted or lowered because of the historical cost of existing plants. Uh, but right now, there are a lot of solid waste management projects that are being told, well, we'll buy electricity from you at two rupees per kilowatt hour. Uh, and obviously, it's not economical, and nobody wants to subsidize different. Whereas the same system is buying at the margin at seven and eight rupees, at least for certain periods. So, just just to say that uh, if one steps back, there's a huge number of issues. There's also a huge number of policies. These policies have to, they're not a single silver bullet for each problem. They need to be combined in order to produce a maximum effect. And the people in charge of these policies are multiple and different. And the great challenge is how do you get it all done together? The good news is that every single thing that I've talked about is happening somewhere in the country. It's just not happening to scale. Thank you. Stay there. I think we'll, we'll have a, a discussion session. I think that would be the best to uh, ask questions and uh, Montague to respond and so on, which is what you wanted to do uh, in the first place. But either I <coughs> respond or you You're respond. That was but, a deal. You know. <laughs> so I, I had the pleasure of reading this uh, paper during the, uh, during the uh, editing process. And uh, some of my suggestions were taken on board and others were not taken on board. But uh, there you are. Um, one thing that, uh, wearing my sort of academic hat, that I thought was really interesting that came out from this paper, I think will bear greater analysis and uh, greater exploration in the academic context, um, is the interplay between pricing instruments and regulation instruments. So what we have, in, in, in not just in India, but in many other countries, is the pricing instrument is misused, so there's, there are